Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. So we're going to switch from Dwight uh, presenting to uh, these, this article by David H. Steele. Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> uh, dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence as we open your word, as we examine the evidences of our faith. And we just pray for a spirit of Christ to rest upon us. We pray for uh, David Thiel. Uh, we pray that you can bless him. And we're thankful for all that are searching for truth and that are studying your word. And we know, Lord, that we all have incomplete understanding of truth. But we know that we can know you and that you can still work in our lives in spite of the fact uh, that we are fallible and uh, uh, limited in in our knowledge. We come to you asking for your power in our lives, for your care and protection, and that you can help us in our day-to-day -day struggles. You know, Lord, that there's many things uh, that we are going through as we study truth. And we just ask that we can continue to advance in our Christian life, as we advance in the knowledge of you. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, good morning again. So so Dwight had gone through, um, I guess it's been a couple of months at least, like maybe a bit more than that, of Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. And in the final verses of chapter 11, dealing with 36 to 45, Uriah Smith departs from our understanding. That is, he's going to have a new power introduced, France, in verse 36. He doesn't see it as the papacy. And he's going to start with a premise that everything in Daniel 11 is literal, that there's no symbolism involved. That is, when it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south, it's talking about Turkey or Syria as the king of the north and Egypt as the king of the south. And so this literal interpretation of this prophecy ignores that after the cross, spiritual. So we have a difference of understanding. <clears throat> now, in our discussion, it came up that there was uh, people who agreed with Uriah Smith's view. And one of them is a guy named David H. Steele. I'm friends with him on Facebook. I've had some chats with him over the last few days. And um, he uh, takes that position that Uriah Smith, that his book on thoughts on Daniel and Revelation are endorsed by Ellen White when she says that they're God's helping hand. And that Smith's position is correct. And that um, people like Louis F. Weir are doing damage to uh, Adventism. So that's where we are trying to go back and examine this ground and see if there is something that uh, we missed. And also that we can fully understand somebody's position who accepts Uriah Smith. And do they have good reasons for uh, their belief or not? Maybe we're the ones who have been misled. So we would need to examine this. And by examining uh, what we believe, if we do it in an open and honest manner, uh, our understanding will be strengthened or we will be corrected. And it's important that we don't do this in a us against them type of mentality that we don't sort of dig in our heels in something that, that is incorrect. Now, in my communication with, with David H. Thiel, he seems a bit emotional about it, but, you know, that could just be an interpretation of social media. You know, he, he claims that I'm accusing him of bias and that I consider my, myself infallible. So I don't know exactly what he's referring to. 
I definitely am not infallible. Never ever thought I was infallible. If I did, then I wouldn't be studying and trying to be uh, corrected. And did I accuse him of bias? Well, I, I think I talked about uh, that all of us have biases. So all of us can have uh, um, confirmation bias. That is, we look at things and we pick things in such a way that we find things that support our reviews and things that don't support our views, we ignore. So it's important to recognize that all of us are biased. I'm not singling him out as having a bias. All of us have a bias. And we have to try to not have that bias. We have to be aware of it. So <clears throat> and we read this first uh, paragraph, and I found it. And, and again, this is was not as a means of it using an ad hominem attack. It's just, I felt that it's a poorly written uh, paragraph, especially as an introductory paragraph to uh, this topic. And maybe there's, maybe it exists in some context and why he could say that, just kind of jump in without really any introduction. And um, it also tends to be full of, uh, you know, emotionally charged language, a little bit polemical. So he's 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 not he's not presenting this in an open way. Right? He's not trying to look at this objectively, at least it doesn't appear to be. He has a specific attack. And now that's just my perception, right? My perception is just my perception. I could be wrong about about this. I don't think it's well written. That that could be a bit more objective because he's not communicating things very clearly, at least not to my mind. And and often, you know, we have that problem. If you write something that you're very familiar with, you sometimes can present it in a way that somebody who's not who's not in your mind might have a hard time understanding what you're writing. But a lot of this is, I would say, is is you know poor sentence structure, poor paragraph structure. You know, if I was marking this in university, I would, you know, not give him a very good mark for this paragraph. So I'm going to read this over again, and then we'll continue on. So he's just going to start out from the time that Elder A.G. Daniels wrote his book. Now, the book here, there's going to be a footnote. It's Arthur G. Daniels, The World War, its relation to the Eastern question in Armageddon. So it's not a book that I've ever read, but I do know that in that history, in after the First World War and in the, in the 20s, Adventism was really focused upon uh, prophecy in a way that was trying to incorporate what had happened in the First World War. Uh, they had um, the precursor to uh, the United Nations, which was called, um, uh, what was it called again? The League of Nations, right? And if you get uh, Adventist books, there's one, um, what was it called? My grandmother had it in her library. It was a black book, probably bought it from a Cole Porter or got it from a Cole Porter. Our Day in the Light of Prophecy, I think it was called, from the 1920s. And, um, you know, it was focused upon things like, you know, the League of Nations and the part they had to play in prophecy. So Adventists were looking at the news headlines of the day and trying to fit these into prophecy. And, and I've always been a bit leery about that, um, trying to sort of look at what's happening today in the news. And then figuring out where is this a fulfillment of prophecy? Uh, because I've seen it happening so many times and none of these things that people have tried to fit into prophecy actually fit. So with this movement, of course, we, we have marked out some major events, the fall of the Soviet Union, which prior to the fall of the Soviet Union, Louis F. Weir had predicted, which is one of the reasons why I accepted Weir. After, I mean, I'd studied his material before that, 
after the Soviet Union had fallen, it seemed pretty evident that he had predicted that event. And then we could see the role that 9-11 has as the arrival of the second angel and the empowerment of the first angel in our line. So we understand this repeat of history. But often we get bogged down in all these little details of speculation. And, and this movement is really no different in what it has tried to do, especially after July 18. So anyway, so A.G. Daniels wrote this book dealing with reflections on, on the, the Great War. That's the First World War. And uh, so from that time that he wrote his book about the reasons why the Great War sucked so many nations into a terrible vortex and projected what might be the outcomes at its conclusion, many events transpired that appeared to raise barriers to the conceptualization that the Ottoman Empire reduced to the boundaries of modern Turkey could ever again ever arise again to such status as to threaten the establishment of a capital in Jerusalem. So I'm not really sure many events transpired that appear to raise barriers to conceptualization. So to the idea that the Ottoman Empire, which had shrunk to become just basically modern Turkey, could ever arise again to such a status as to threaten the establishment of capital in Jerusalem. So He's taking this idea <clears throat> that uh, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is addressing uh, Turkey and this situation in Jerusalem. So somebody reading this paper who doesn't know anything about this, obviously would be completely baffled by what he's, he's saying here. Now, maybe in the context of where he presented this paper, he's jumping into a discussion that's already contextualized, but at this point he hasn't really introduced what he's talking about. By 1923, Turkey had been secularized, the capital moved from Constantinople to Ankara, and Great Britain had a mandate to exercise civil authority over much of the Middle East, but particularly that of Palestine, and specifically that of Jerusalem. Seventh-day Adventist Bible prophecy students, pastors, evangelists, and scholars mostly continued to toe the line, so to speak, on Uriah Smith's position regarding the Eastern question, even as Germany once more militarized its government and mobilized its population for the commencement of World War II, a terrible conflict that surpassed the horrors of the war to end all wars, which was the First World War. Still, during the 1920s and 30s, some, like Louis F. Weir, became dissatisfied by the appearance of false conclusion and began to change their positions. So so what he's saying is that people had looked at the headlines here and things that had happened and said, well, maybe Smith was wrong. Now, we know that Smith's views were attacked much earlier than the 1920s and 30s, but he's trying to put it here in this context because they had failed. Uh, by 1944, editors at the Review and Herald made the decision to continue publishing Smith's book, Daniel and Revelation, but with deletions that went beyond editing out any semi-Aryan leanings so, um, that Smith held on the human nature of Christ. Now, what is he talking about here, semi-Aryan leanings that Smith held on the human nature of Christ? Anybody know what he would be talking about? What is he talking about here? Nobody has any thoughts on that? Smith's semi-Aryan? Yeah. Lean, leanings of Smith. So so what he's saying is that they had edited out semi-Aryan leanings that Smith had on the human nature of Christ. I didn't know there was Aryan views on the human nature of Christ. Right. So I'm not really sure. Maybe something to do with is he God, fully God, or just God-man? Um, I'm just looking here on the internet quickly. Arian theology, theology holds that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who was begotten by the Father, with the difference that the Son of God did not always exist, but was begotten. So that has nothing to do with his human nature. Um, so I'm not sure what he's referring to. I don't know of any... Arian teachings regarding the human nature of Christ. 
So I guess I could ask David H. Thiel what he means by that. But he's saying, so that went beyond just editing out these things, whatever they were, I don't know, to those historical paragraphs that had given such great weight to Smith's conclusions regarding the Eastern question. In so doing, the groundwork was laid for a multitude of interpretations on Daniel 11, with an emphasis on the identity of the king in the north being the papacy and a variety of divergent identities of the king of the south, including Islam, atheism, communism, and others. By 1948, the British would leave Palestine, allowing Zionists to plant the blue star of David emblem on a white flag of the newly birthed nation, modern Israel. This is the historical backdrop of a book that Louis F. Weir published in 1949 on the identity of the King of the North. <clears throat> so, so that book is uh, the King of the North at Jerusalem, God's People Delivered. So Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Oh, it's in Melbourne. Okay. <clears throat> so that's his introductory paragraph. It's a bit scattered. Has it really framed things? I mean, we, we've sort of looked at it, tried to frame what it is. But basically, the premise here is that when we reject, reject, or when we rejected Uriah Smith's understanding of the Eastern question, we open doors to all kinds of interpretation, which David Thiel thinks uh, have been damaging to the Adventist message. A prophecy that that's why there's so much confusion and and he's labeling Weir as a big part of that while we are raised many objections to Uriah Smith's position on the eastern question it is the objective of this paper to narrow the field down to those issues underpinning the objections to those of major importance James White's position on the king of the north being the papacy and his objections were echoed the omissions of William Miller's and Adams Clark's positions on the King of the North because they significantly influenced Smith. The double standard of White and Weir regarding the exposition of unfulfilled prophecy. Okay. Okay. And the distinct differences between rules or principles of Bible interpretation presented by Weir and Miller. And how Josiah... Joshua Himes responded to attacks on Millerite human hermeneutics and some of the historic reasons why we are thought it impossible for Turkey to be the king of the north and the accusation that Uriah Smith was a false prophet informed and influenced by a Jesuit fostered system of interpretation that would prevent Smith and his adherents from ever accepting and teaching the genuine message of righteousness by faith. To do justice to the critique, references to biographical and historical facts relevant to the discussion will also be provided. So now to that last one, so it's going to be interesting looking at each of these. But to that last one, we can say that we take the position that Uriah Smith is simply um, using the Protestant system of interpretation, which you can say is Jesuit fostered, right? So how Smith, and we've noted how Smith has approached things, is definitely not Miller's rules. But uh, Thiel is going to argue that that Smith used Miller's rules and that Lewis F. Weir didn't. So it's going to be interesting to see how he he frames this, this argument. So he says, uh, Lewis Fritz... Fitzroy Weir was born April 29th, 1896, in Prospect, South Australia. His grandfather, Walter Weir, had become a Seventh-day Adventist by the turn of the century through his father, though his father, Albert, did not. Soon after Lewis became a Seventh-day Adventist, he married Jesse Blanche Anderson, a convert about the same time as Lewis and a few months older than he, on November 11th, 1915. Lewis would graduate from Avondale College from the Missionary and Bible Worker course in November 1919. By January 1825, or 19, January 18, 1925, Weir was ordained, having labored successfully in the South New Zealand Conference for some time. After many years of co-laboring in the work, 
Jesse would succumb to a long battle with cancer on January 6th, 1942. A much respected and beloved Seventh-day Adventist pastor, evangelist, missionary, and publishing author, Louis Weir, found himself in a vulnerable position shortly after he remarried on January 25th, uh, 1943. So that's a bit over a year later to Alma Bell uh, Proust that would lead to false accusations of improper conduct. When the South Australian Conference Executive Committee voted to dismiss Weir on March 9th, 1943, the woman involved in the matter wrote letters to the president of the conference and to Weir in an effort to clear his name. When President Scragg objected to the dismissal at to Union headquarters, the matter ended up being sent back uh, to the local uh, conference for review. He would not be disfellowshipped over the appearance of indiscretion, but Louis Weir was never reinstated as a pastor, even though he reapplied in 1954. He and Alma remained faithful members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in good standing, giving Bible studies and leaving uh, candidates with the pastor to baptize. On April 12th, 1967, about three weeks before his 71st birthday, Weir died from a heart attack. But the influence of his theories on hermeneutics and defense of James White would live on swelling in popularity until it has become the majority view today. <clears throat> now, I'm not really quite sure if that's correct as far as we are becoming the majority view. Uh, do we find that Louis F. Weir's uh, view on prophecy is the majority view today? I don't see it. I don't see that. <laughs> not, not, not by the farthest stretch of your imagination. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm kind of wonder. Now, there are there are things that can be sort of similar. That is, there's lots of interpretations, but I wouldn't I wouldn't directly attribute them to. Louis F. Weir's interpretations. Okay, so so he's given us some of this background. We know that there was some some reason why Louis F. Weir had his credentials removed, something to do from the time from I guess when his wife died to when he got remarried. Some accusations about his conduct in some way, and we don't know exactly what they are. So. It obviously didn't affect his his second wife's relationship with him, uh, and uh, but it did cause his credentials to be removed. So we don't know specifically what was behind that. We weren't there. We don't know any of that information. Now, is that information useful in studying what Lewis F. Weir says? Well, it can create some biases. Now, the main thing that uh, Thiel is going to try to argue is because of his bitterness for what the church did, that's why he's going to come up with this different interpretation of scripture. Does that make any sense to anyone? How does bitterness affect our interpretation? It doesn't make sense. No, I mean, unless there's specifically somebody who's attacking him that he's bitter about and it's in an opposition to that individual. But I can't see that uh, the church treating him badly would give him a vendetta against Uriah Smith. Walter Ray with the church, something where he was bitter and came against the church. Yeah, but that's something against the church. We don't see anything of what his interpretation here is anything against the church. Right? Like, no, no, no. Right. Just an al alternate w interpretation. Yeah, so so I, I think to sort of bring this into the discussion as a reason why he takes this position doesn't really make uh, much sense. He says, uh, Thiel says, one might then conjecture based upon the short biography that Weir would be strongly motivated to vindicate James White and his position on the papacy fulfilling Daniel 11.45. Okay. Can anybody explain to me why he would be strongly motivated to vindicate James White in his position on the papacy, fulfilling Daniel 11, verse 45, based upon this biography? Is there anything that you can see that would motivate him? There's something called triangulation when, when 
there's two people who are opposed to each other in their views, try to draw in a third party onto their side, maybe something like that. Um, I don't sort of suspected imputed motives. Yeah. Okay. So, so he, he, one might also conclude that his attempt to vindicate White, he didn't learn from his own experience because he appears to use every means possible to excoriate Uriah Smith, presenting every evidence possible of Ellen White's reproofs and corrections where, wherever Smith strayed on matters such as the humanity and divinity of Christ or righteousness by faith in 1888. So. I'm not quite sure how any of this would come from what happened to him personally. Now, Dwight, you, you have some insights into basically Uriah Smith. You've studied into detail regarding Ellen White's uh, position regarding Uriah Smith. Right. Can you follow what, what Theo is saying here? No. Do you, something I'm missing? You're not missing anything. Okay. So, so he's he's trying to say because of what happened to him, what happened to Weir, he's he's somehow motivated then to vindicate James White and attack Uriah Smith. But I'm not sure why. I I can't put together the these ideas at all. Right. And See, the, yeah. the the problem that I've got here with Thiel's premise so far. Mm -hmm. his defense of Smith and his attack on Weir mm -hmm. are neither well-founded. Yes. And, and, and I don't know, like, I mean, he uses the word excoriate. <laughs> right. You know, you could say uh, criticize Uriah Smith's position, but he, he's, he's excoriating Weir, right? I mean, Correct. basically, He's trying to look at Weir's motivations rather than looking at Weir's arguments at this point. Right. Right. So. So we can see that that's not the best way to approach a theological discussion. To try to look at the motivations behind the person's position rather than just the position itself. Correct. That right. That, the best way if uh, disagreeing with someone's position, leave their name out of it, just address the points. It makes it a personal vendetta. Yeah, and, and I don't see how Weir has any, uh, you know, uh, like, I, I can't follow this at all. I mean, it, it just none of it makes sense to me. Now, excoriate, uh, Kelly gave us there the definition to flay or to strip or to wear off the skin, to abrade, to gall, to break and remove the cuticle in any manner is by rubbing, beating, or by action of acrid substances. So, um, pretty inflammatory, pretty inflammatory language. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the thing that I would try to avoid is this type of language, this type of imagery in addressing a theological discussion. I don't I don't think it really has any place. What happened to Louis F. Weir, what his motivations might be, what kind of conjectures or conclusions we could draw from that. I would never even would never even enter my mind that what happened to Weir would be a, a reason for him to vindicate James White and attack Uriah Smith. Just doesn't make any sense to me. Right? It doesn't follow logically. Okay, so he, he's going to go on and try to explain this. Perhaps we have felt some self-indication in the face of early opposition to his views. When years later he concluded, today our godly scholars revere the memory of Pastor James White, where after years of research and weighing all the evidence, the majority accept the truth maintained by him that the papacy is indeed the king of the north. Now, now, if we're going to say that that's the majority view, that the papacy is the king of the north in Daniel 11, that may have been true at that time. I don't know. I don't know if it's understood that way today. I don't think most people even care about Daniel 11, verse uh, 40 to 45. So what he's saying is that he had some early opposition to his views and since he had this opposition, 
that he was looking for some kind of self-vindication. So his motives for studying these things and drawing his conclusions have to do with the way he was treated by the church. Makes no sense to me. I, I mean, I just, I can't follow that argument at all. And, and I don't think it has any place in the discussion. Uh, and we do that all the time, though. It's a very common thing. We, we look at somebody who we disagree with and we try to pick out what their motives are of why they disagree with us. Right. You know, now it could be that there are some motives people have of why they take positions they do, but we can't know what they are. And they're not really pertinent when it comes to discussing the Bible. Right. In argument style, it's called mind reading. <laughs> yeah. So. So so we don't know Lewis F. Mir personally. We have no idea what his motives were. Um, and to try to flesh them out from the fact that he held a position um, and that he, he agreed with James White and that somehow he felt vindicated. I don't know. Was he looking for vindication? How do we know that? We don't know anything about his personality, his motives. So to me, this is really a stretch. But also, I just think it doesn't have any place in the discussion. He goes on, the veracity of such a conclusion can only be tested by the accuracy of fulfilled prophecies. Now, think about that question or that statement for a minute. So the veracity of such a conclusion, whether this is true or not, can only be tested by the accuracy of fulfilled prophecies. Is that true? It, would there be any connection between our surmising somebody's motives and and testing it by whether prophecies are fulfilled? I don't see the connection. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding his sentence. M maybe what he's saying, whether James White is correct or not, whether Weir's position is correct or not. Maybe that's the conclusion he's talking about. The conclusion of Weir, maybe that makes more sense, uh, can only be tested by the accuracy of fulfilled prophecies. Well, which which I think would be true if you're saying when we look at prophecy and we make predictions, those can be tested by the accuracy of whether they are fulfilled or not to some degree. Right. The danger of such a claim inherently demonstrates the very kind of idolizing of ministers of which we have been warned. Now. Can you see here that Thiel is muddying the waters? That's a logical fall fallacy. What is what is he doing here by putting this sentence in there? What is, what is he suggesting? So he's talking about Lewis F. We were talking about Pastor James White and that. Uh, he's judging Lewis F. Weir's mental state. Uh, but, so yeah, which but also, are you speaking yeah. about today are godly scholars? <laughs> to, well, they, yeah, I'm not I'm sure. So, <laughs> can't hear you. Yeah. It, so anyway, he's trying to say, well, the fact that they, you know, revere, we have godly scholars who revere James White, that's da a danger. But isn't Thiel taking that position regarding Uriah Smith? I mean, obviously, there's a danger of putting people above God's word. Is that what Weir is doing here? Isn't that what Thiel is sort of doing with Uriah Smith? But he's he's framing this whole discussion in this polemical framework, very argumentative framework. He's he's not just presenting facts and and scriptural arguments. Okay, now he's going to present some scriptural arguments as we will see. But at this point, he's framing everything before he presents any scripture. The amount of time that has passed since the deaths of those who originally proclaimed their positions only to have prophecy remain unfulfilled should prompt us to question not the reasons for the rightness or wrongness of interpretations, but for reasons why the winds of strife are held back. It is because God's people lack the character, the righteousness of Christ, that we are not yet sealed and the sealings. Sealing is complete and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is granted in the full strength of the latter rain. 
Then the winds of strife will be released and the remaining prophecy will be accomplished as it should be. Now, this is sort of an underlying premise of his, which he hasn't really presented uh, in how I would present it if I was, I would have put this in the beginning paragraph, I would have put some of these conclusions there, say what his view is. But he has the position that Uriah Smith's um, predictions didn't succeed because of the failure of the church, not because of the incorrectness of his interpretation of prophecy, and that they will be fulfilled once the church um, reflects Christ's character. So uh, Thiel tends to be, from what I can see, obviously follows um, amazing discoveries. He's a conservative, you know, so so in, in that way, you know, that's why you know, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I see him post lots of things I agree with. But uh, here he has a view which which is partially true. We know that um, that there needs to be this, uh, you know, Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. But he's trying to say that the problem wasn't that, you know, Uriah Smith interpreted the prophecy wrong. It's just that the church failed. And and we can, to some degree, agree that the, we agree that the church has failed. And we have a structure in explaining why and how that all came about. Um, he's got his own sort of uh, take on it. Uh, but has all the evidence truly been discovered? We must ask ourselves the question, how much of Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, has been fulfilled by the papacy between 1798 and 1870, or for that matter, since James White died in 1881? We know the answer. If we believe the papacy is the king of the or north, then the answer is none. Even though we might see how prophecies relating to Revelation have been leading up to fulfillment, there is still controversy over the healing of the deadly wound, with some saying it was healed in 1929 when Mussolini restored papal sovereignty, while others make a case that the deadly wound cannot be healed so long as the papacy is not a persecuting power as it used to be. If we could connect any viable evidence to the actual text of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, we wouldn't be having the discussion on who is right in their interpretation. Okay. Um, wow. Can, can you see this, some of the problems here? <laughs> so the question, since 1798, has the papacy been a part of the fulfillment of prophecy? Now he's saying, well, we can't nail it down. We've got disagreements regarding that. Now, he seems to be ignoring Lewis F. Weir's interpretation and definitely ignoring what we believe. So, so we believe that the church went into the wilderness, so to speak. We have the four generations of Adventism, you know, after the failure of the Millerites to bring about the second coming, right? So their, their rejection of Millerite history. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, he doesn't talk about four generations. Deal? Um, no, he doesn't really talk about four generations as such. But but what I'm saying is that that here with uh, um, with Thiel, he's he um, you know he understands that there's a failure of Adventism, like we all do. Uh, but the question is, what part does the papacy have to play? Once you once you understand. Weir's position on Daniel 11, verse 40b, and you connect it with the repeat of history and the repeat of the first, second, and third angels' messages in our history, um, then this all makes sense. But, but this, this, this paragraph, I think, is pretty weak. And, and I think, you know, this has all the evidence truly been discovered, right? So he's trying to say, well, um, we need to look at Uriah Smith's view again and look at the events. Um, because if you take the King of the North to be the papacy, we don't see anything happening since 1798, once the Pope was taken captive, which I think is kind of crazy because we have the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989. Did the papacy have any part to play in that? Huge part. <laughs> yeah. And Louis F. Weir predicted it, right? So yeah. for him, for him to write this paragraph, 
would be expressing almost complete ignorance about Lewis F. Weir's position and how it was fulfilled and the time that we're living in today. So to say uh, the answer is none is like a crazy. I mean, it, it's just, to me, it's not, it's not believable that he could write that. Okay. Now then he says, on the other hand, if we believe Turkey is the king of the north, then all but Daniel 11 verse 45 has been fulfilled since 1798. And yet current events are demonstrating uh, a potential revival of the caliphate with the formation of ISIS or ISIL and the revived persecution of Christians within the Levant. That is uh, named basically Syria, Palestine, Egypt that might end up with a literal conflict over the combative demands of Turkey for Jerusalem. Now, you can see here that Thiel is looking at contemporary events. So he says that Uriah Smith was correct all the way up to verse 44. Verse 45 hasn't been fulfilled yet. And, um, and those are the events that are going to be coming next, right? And, and, of course, he's looking at what happened with ISIS and so forth. So this paper was uh, uh, written in, well, I think we, we we came to the conclusion it was 2015 uh, that the PDF was made, right? I think that's, we just looked at the document properties. And, yes, yeah, 2018, pardon me. So 2018, October 8th, 2018 is is when the PDF was made, whether that's when it was originally uh, written, I'm not sure. Okay, so we can see that, uh, uh, what, what's ISIS doing right now? And, and then he has the speculation that just might end up with a literal conflict over the combative, dem combative demands of Turkey for Jerusalem. Is Turkey looking to uh, control Jerusalem? I don't see any any hint of that yeah yeah you could say well it, islam is but not islam is but not turkey yeah islam is but not turkey right right uh, turkey is not really i mean it is an islamic country but it's not it's not a radical islamic country but you know he's going to say that it's going to still the rightness or wrongness of our understanding is not going to hasten or delay the fulfillment of prophecy. If we would hasten the coming of Jesus, we must be perf we must perfectly reflect the character of Jesus so that the sealing might be completed. The universal probation of all humankind is closed and the four winds of strife released. So obviously we can see that his view about Turkey being the king of the north, from our understanding of events, uh, compared to the papacy being the king of the north, and Daniel 11, verse 40b, being fulfilled in 1989, I would think that we have a stronger case than what he's presenting for his position. Right? I don't believe that he has a case. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't believe he has a case at all. Right? It, to me, it's extremely weak conjecture, but his, his sort of dismissing of the role of the papacy, as Louis F. Weir outlined it, is, is kind of remarkable, since it was a fulfillment of prophecy. So he says, Elder Louis F. Weir wrote and published books and articles on Bible hermeneutics, prophecy, and the three angels' messages. He strongly questioned the validity of Uriah Smith's position on the Eastern question, simply because historical events had not panned out as many has thought and taught. Now, I don't believe that that's correct. So I don't think it's simply because historical events had not panned out. I don't think that that would be the reason why Lewis F. Weir rejected Uriah Smith's position on the Eastern question. I would think it's simply because Lewis F. Weir is trying to study the Bible, following Miller's rules, and, and applying them correctly. Okay. One pamphlet he published deals with the article that James Springer White wrote in the Review and Herald on November 29, 1877, untitled, titled Unfulfilled Prophecy. 
Lewis Weir observed that a portion of this article was used in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 877, um, and that it did not reflect well on the whole context of the original source document, postulating it is unfortunate that the employment of only a portion of James White's article had caused some to find support for a belief that the whole of his article makes clear he did not support. He unwaveringly taught until his death that the beast power of Revelation 13 is the king of the north, uh, the power that would persecute the remnant church, the power that would come to his end with none to help him. He had no doubt about the future of this power. Those who use this portion of this article and suggest doubt concerning the certainty of the king of the north, that the king of the north is Rome, do injustice to James White's, uh, James White, for in that very issue of the Review and Herald, he emphatically declared that Rome is the king of the north. Now, we probably should look at that article. So November 29th, 1877. Let's see if we can find it quickly. Okay, 1877. Okay, so when you go on the LNG white disc, it gives us, let me see here, it only goes up to 1866. So let's see if I can find this. Now, so I'm not quite sure exactly what this issue is regarding unfulfilled prophecy. Anybody know anything about that? Okay, I found the article. At least part of it. Okay, so I'm going to switch here. Okay, so this at least part of the article. Now comes the point in the argument upon which very much depends. Does the 11th chapter of Daniel cover the ground measured by chapter 2, 7, and 8? If so, then the last power mentioned in that chapter is Rome. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. And he shall come to his end and none shall help from Daniel 11.45. It is said that Palestine is such a glorious land and that the Turkish seat of the government is to be removed to that land. Then we will remark, Palestine has had the curse of God resting upon it since the death of the Son of God. Whatever it may have, it may have been, it is not now at the time of the prophet the time the prophecy speaks to us, any such a country, if there is any portion of our world that God has forsaken more than more than another, it is that which drunk up the blood of the prophets, the son of God and his holy apostles. But the Western continent is now at the time of the, of the fulfillment of the prophecy, such just such a land here stretching between the Atlantic and the Pacific is a country which is the desire of all nations. Even the poor Chinaman, with all his idolatry and filth, flocks to our comparatively delightful land by uh, thousands. Okay, so now here they're addressing the glorious holy mountain as the glorious land. So we would make a distinction between the glorious holy mountain and the glorious land, right? The glorious land being the United States, the glorious holy mountain being God's church. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, part of the problem here that James White's has is just simply the translation of the King James, James between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. But it doesn't say that in Hebrew, doesn't have uh, in the glorious holy mountain. Uh, it actually has a lamed, not a bet at the beginning of of mountain, which is the noun that would have to have that that uh, prefix, right? So it means against or to between the seas, against the glorious holy mountain, or because it has between, it would really be between the tabernacles of his palace are going to be planted between the seas and the glorious holy mountain it would be a better way to translate it. But anyway, we would agree with James White that Palestine at the end of the world is not uh, the glorious land, right? It is here that all nations are represented. Three years since, in a Catholic procession, which was three hours passing a given point on carriage, flung to the breeze 32 flags representing the number of nations. Our free schools, the freedom of the press, and the freedom of religious liberty added to the fertility of our vast country make it at this time the land of delight. 
we close this article with the inquiries, viewing the past and the present, is there not more probable probability that the seat of the beast will be moved to our country than that the seat of the Turkish government will be moved to Palestine? Okay, so that's James White's position. And we can see that that makes a lot of sense, right? Having the, the seat of the Turkish government, government moved to Palestine would have no part in end time prophecy, but having the seat of the papacy basically moved to the land of liberty, that would make much more sense that the seat of the beast will be moved to our country. I'm not saying necessarily the seat, but basically the papacy will control the United States. So then he says, and in advancing opinions upon unfulfilled prophecy, is it not safer to move slowly? Right? So that's the, the part dealing with unfulfilled prophecy. So James White is saying that Uriah Smith is not moving slowly, that he's making claims about the Turkish government, which would be inconsistent with how we understand the prophecies in the book of Daniel. So that's that's part of the article. I'll, I'll take a look over the, find the whole article and take a look at it, you know, before tomorrow's study. So we can address that. And if, if there's things in there that I think are of note, okay, I'll switch back here. So he, he, he waveringly taught until his death. Um, but the beast power of Revelation 13 is the king of the north. Okay. Those who use this portion of his article and suggest doubt concerning the certainty that the king of the north is Rome do injustice to James White. For in that very issue of the Review and Herald, he emphatically declared that Rome is the king of the north. So we didn't we didn't get that part. So I'm going to try to find that statement that Lewis F. Weir is referring to here. So Thiel goes on, but Weir's claim that White unwaveringly taught until his death that the beast power is the king of the north is an exaggeration of historical fact. According to Willie White, now, if we were in a court of law, how much how much weight would we put on Willie White's uh opinion about what his father presented none <laughs> yeah okay and why is that it is hearsay it's hearsay right and yep. and and how much willie white really understood the issue and what what kind of memory he has about his father i mean how old would willie white be when his dad died he would have been fairly young you know, not a child. Well, no matter what the age is, it still would have been hearsay because you you cannot admit hearsay testimony in any manner within a court. Right. Yeah, because it's hearsay, but it's also many, many years after the fact. And, and here's what he's going to say. He said his father had presented a different opinion to check a movement that he thought was bordering into fanaticism and might lead to the hindrance of the work to be done. He was reproved by the Lord for bringing in distrust as the unity of the leaders and sank down in discouragement and thus the great financial campaign to overcome the debts of the Battle Creek College and Sanitarium as well as establishing mission offices in Europe and Britain collapsed. So, I mean, this type of thing, what, what he's presenting here, what Thiel is presenting here, isn't really, shouldn't even really be brought into the discussion. And what we would have to look at is, is there any evidence in James White's writings that he thought anything different? Right? Correct. Okay. To, to have, and, and this is full of all kinds of conjecture, conjecture on Willie White's part and, and Thiel's part as well. Right. So he says, indeed, Willie's conversation is consistent with the tone of James White's 1877 article as indicative in his closing statement, posing the form of the question and in advancing opinions upon unfulfilled prophecy. Is it not safer to move slowly? So he's really stretching here in how he's interpreting uh, this information in the process of publishing this exaggeration. Lewis Weir violated principles of which White wrote in the article published in 1877. 
It, is, it also appears that a double standard is uplifted, one by which Smith was required to uphold, while White and later Weir could skirt around with immunity as they made their assertions and predictions. For purpose of closer scrutiny, I've quoted White's 1877 article in total with emphasis added. Oh, he has it all here for us. Okay. Um, I should have remembered because I looked through that. I remember this was in here. The Bible was given as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It was designed for the benefit of the people in this world and not the next. It is the sure word of prophecy that shines in this dark world. It was not designed for angels or for immortal saints. Therefore, we shall not have to wait until we reach heaven before we understand what the Lord has said to us in his word. The Bible is what God has revealed to man. And if he does not understand it, the fault is because that he does not search its pages as he should, or because he does not live as near him as he should, so that we can understand what the Lord has revealed. To say that the Bible was given to be understood, and who will deny this plain proposition, is one thing. And to say that we do not understand every chapter and every verse is quite another thing. Fulfilled prophecy may be understood by the Bible student. Prophecy is history in advance. He can compare history with prophecy and find a complete fit as the glove to the hand, it having been made for it. But in exposition of unfulfilled prophecy, where the history is not written, the student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness, lest he find himself strained in the field of fancy. There are those who think more of future truth than of present truth, and they see but little light in the path in which they walk, but think they see great light ahead of them. Positions taken upon the Eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet been there, have not yet their fulfillment. Here we should tread lightly and take positions carefully, lest we be found removing the landmarks fully established in the Advent movement. It may be said that there is a general agreement upon this subject and that all eyes are turned toward the war now in progress between Turkey and Russia as the fulfillment of that portion of prophecy which will give great confirmation of faith in the soon loud cry and close of our message. But what will be the result of this positiveness in unfulfilled prophecies, should things not come out as very confidently expected, is an anxious question. Wars, pestilences, famines, and earthquakes are not the surest signs of the end. These have ever existed. We may have war, then peace, pestilence, then health, famine, then plenty, earthquakes, then the bowels of the earth may be quiet. But the message of the third angel is given but once. The progress of this work in fulfilled prophecy is the highest and brightest light now shining in the religious heavens. Those looking at the Eastern question will probably be disappointed, but we may bear our way, whole weight upon the last message without fear of disappointment. As we now see our worldwide message extending to the nations, we see the fulfillment of prophecy and the clearest sign of the close of the work and the consummation of the hope of the church. Let us take a brief view of the line of prophecy four times spanned in the book of Daniel. It will be admitted that the same ground was passed over in chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11, with the exception that Babylon is left out in chapters 8 and 11. We first pass down the great image of chapter 2, where Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome are pre represented by the gold, silver, brass, and iron. We all agree that these feet are not Turkish, but Roman. And as we pass down, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the beast with ten horns, representing the same as the great image. Again, all will agree that it is not Turkey that is cast into the burning flame, but the Roman beast. So of chapter 8, all agree that the little horn that stood up against the prince of princes is not Turkey, but Rome. In all these three lines thus far, Rome is the last form of government mentioned. Now comes the point in the argument upon which very much depends. Does the 11th chapter of the prophecy of Daniel cover the grand measure by chapters 2, 7, and 8? If so, then the last power mentioned in that chapter is Rome, right? So then we read this part, at least part of that. Yeah, yeah, we read that. Yeah, so there we are. There's the end of the article. So, so we can see that what James White is doing and what Lewis F. Weir are doing are consistent with Bible prophecy. What Smith was doing was not. Is that advancing slowly to 
because when we look at Lewis F. Weir's predictions, he is not doing the same thing that Smith is doing, correct? What's that would be correct? Because yeah. Well, yeah, go on. Weir and White mm-hmm. are applying Miller's rules properly, and Smith is ignoring Miller's rules. Right. And Smith is now looking at what everybody's looking at at that time and interpreting the prophecy based upon the headlines. Now, a person could argue that that's what Weir was doing. But is Weir basing his prophecy upon the headlines? Is there headlines there that, you know, the papacy is going to combine uh, join hands with the United States and overthrow the Soviet Union. Is that the headlines of the day? No. No, right? So all Weir is doing is saying, if we look at prophecy consistently, if we follow Miller's rules, we would we would have to see that that is what's going to happen in the future. That the United States and the papacy are going to join hands to overthrow the Soviet Union. That's consistent with what Ellen White teaches. So for him to sort of say, well, you know, Louis F. Weir can ignore this regarding unfulfilled prophecy. There's a huge difference between what Smith is doing and what Weir is doing. And and Weir makes it quite clear that the problem that Smith had and that many people have is that they are interpreting prophecy based upon the headlines of the day that they're 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 manipulating the prophecies based upon what they see in the newspapers and on the news right and what was it James ever changing what was how did, how did James White put it something or prophecy that it couldn't be interpreted she, yeah. Brazil, couldn't yeah, yeah, couldn't yeah, predict the future say, based on the prophecies, but prophecies were proved true by the headlines of the past. That's a rough paraphrase. Well, yeah. So yeah, so we look at fulfilled prophecy, right? As James White said in this article, that we can understand fulfilled prophecy, right? It's we can look back and see right, right. prophecy. When we're looking at the future, we have to be more carefully. We have to move slowly. It doesn't mean we don't move at all, but they need to be based upon it, what has happened before, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we look at a repeat of history. I mean, there's there's a consistency on how we have applied uh, Daniel eleven verse 40 to 45, with the other lines of prophecy that we see more and more detail. And as we look at Revelation, again, we have Ellen White's statements about what is going to happen. We don't see her making any statements regarding Turkey, right? She, She makes lots of statements regarding the papacy and the United States and spiritualism, okay? But especially the papacy in the United States, the Protestants in the United States joining hands with the papacy, which is what Louis F. Weir is predicting. He's predicting the same thing Ellen White was predicting. There's quite a stir afoot with uh, the first. I can't even remember how to pronounce it. And he's just in something. The, the fellow that... I really can't listen to. But I tried to. Listen, I did listen to it last. Yeah, night. you're talking so about um, shared it. Uh, Victor Victor David no, Hansen. No, no. And we just no. Her name. He, he's a black fellow that. Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Prophesy again. Yeah, it's the one. Yeah, it's yeah, the one really that difficult for me to listen. You know, I don't want to speak one that was. Colin listens to him. Anyway, someone shared a link to for me, and I I suffered through it. But I you know give it a fair hearing, and it's, it's just so. Uh, it's about the twenty 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 five project and so on, and you know how quoting people 
yeah. you know, play clips if they're not going to accommodate Sabbath. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, isn't Trump's wife a Sabbath keeping? Yeah, um, no, his, his, his son, is, his son, son is married to a Jew. Yeah. His son, no, 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 Jared Kushner, his son in law, is a Sabbath keeping Jew. Oh, so he's a Sabbath keeping Jew. His daughter married a Sabbath keeping His daughter married Jared Kushner, yes. His Trump's wife is very much Catholic. JD yeah. is very much Catholic. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I remember the tension when 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 they, they elected uh, John F. Kennedy, but I don't think that his religion affected his politics. Yeah. Well, as it was said at the time of that election, there were there were many that were concerned about the fact that JFK was Catholic. Now, one of the more direct comments was a specific senator was not so afraid of the Pope as he was of the Pop, the father, because Kennedy's Kennedy's father had made substantial money during the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But anyway, the point, the point here is that, um, People get caught up in the news headlines of the day to interpret prophecy. And that's not what Louis F. Weir was doing. I just remember president after president was going to bring in the Sunday law and never, never happened to have us. Since Reagan thought it was going to happen. Yeah, okay. so I, just, I just take an attitude of wait and see. Yeah. And like we discussed yesterday, how is that helping us to prepare? Well, let's let's go on and read here. We've got uh, about 10 more minutes. Uh, When one prophesies, the foretelling of future events can only mean unrevealed history is about to be made. The future, from the prophet's perspective, becomes history to the reader or hearer of prophecy, depending on the proximity to the prognosticator. Uh, The Apostle John would see more prophecy fulfilled than did Daniel. Martin Luther could see more prophecy fulfilled than John. William Miller and Josiah Lish could see more prophecy fulfilled than Luther. Uriah Smith could see more prophecy fulfilled than William Miller, Josiah Lish, and Adam Clark. Uh, Miller, Lish, and Clark interpreted the fulfilling of Daniel 11, the same as Uriah Smith, except Miller and Lish taught that verses 44 and 45 applied to France, Great Britain, and Russia. Of the three, only Adam Clark proposed that verse 44 and 45 were as yet unfulfilled. Why did Miller and Lich think this way? How does our proximity to history aid in our perspective of fulfilled prophecy? Now, this, of course, is going to affect his argument in ways that he's not really willing to see. But um, because Uriah Smith obviously uh, saw less fulfilled prophecy than Lewis F. Weir. And we see more fulfilled prophecy than Lewis F. Weir, right? So you can see how his argument is kind of self-defeating. Napoleon Bonaparte wanted to create an empire equal to or greater than that of Alexander the Great. He desired to win for France all the territories conquered by Alexander as a legacy for himself. He had conquered most of Italy and Malta in 1797 preparing the way for General Berthier to arrest the Pope in 1798, a significant date, for it was the fulfilling of the prophecies 1260-day-for-a-year time period of papal oppression. But the subsequent invasion of Malta before Napoleon moved on to Egypt proved to be the fulcrum for Russia turning against France. Napoleon had wanted Russia as an ally. The Knights of St. John, being expelled from Malta, uh, by the French general proved to be the excuse Tsar Alexander I would use to war against France, um, declaring himself to be the patron and protector of this order. Great Britain would prove victorious in naval battles at the Nile Delta and all along the Palestine coast, hindering Napoleon's supply lines by sea and capturing his siege apparatus. Napoleon would not receive the news of Russia's declaration of war until after his retreat from uh, where 
Um, the combined forces of British and Turks proved persistent enough opponents to force Napoleon back into Egypt. It was this news that Britain in the north and Russia in the east had formed an alliance and would transport Ottoman troops by sea to Egypt that would suffice as prophetic fulfillment in the mind of William Miller. I thought it was, anyway. Uh, Napoleon quickly decided to flee Egypt for France to protect and restore his reputation. At that time, Rear Admiral Nelson knew of three French corsairs, privately owned and armed ships used as privateers, sailing from Egypt. But thinking that Napoleon was too proud and arrogant a man to use such vessels as a means of personal transport, Nelson allowed them to slip through the ever-tightening blockade. It was as great a miracle for Napoleon's escape as had been the initial invasion at Alexandria, where Nelson arrived before the French, thinking he was behind them, and then departing to search them out just as a day or two before the French fleet appeared. God's hand was certainly moving in the events of men. Thus, Miller concluded that the terrible bloodshed of Napoleon's Russian campaign fulfilled verse 44 of Daniel 11. He reasoned that Napoleon also fulfilled verse 45 by his conquest of Italy, Rome being the glorious mountain of Catholicism located between two seas, and that Napoleon eventually came to his end because none shall help him. Josiah Litch would virtually concur with William Miller, and uh, even after the Great Disappointment, Otis Nichols would publish along the same lines regarding Napoleon fulfilling, fulfilling verse 45, though he thought England to be the king of the north and France to be the king of the south. Now, so in addressing this issue of the proximity of the people who are making these predictions, we know that part of the problem that they have here, Miller, is he must believe that these are going to be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ, before the close of probation, right? That there is no way that Miller could have understood Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. It would be impossible, right? Do we agree with, with that? I would have to agree. Yeah. So we know that part of the problem and that what James White is pointing out, when we have unfulfilled prophecy, and we try to, to to predict what's going to happen based in the context of where we are at, that we can make mistakes because we don't know where we are in the complete line of prophecy. So we, we examined how Miller and, and the pioneers in the Millerite period understood Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And we can see that they made a number of mistakes. One is they didn't follow Miller's rules. But part of that was because they thought Christ was returning soon. They didn't have the keys to unlock that. Now, Weir, what he does is he consistently follows through, as James White does, that Rome must be the final power in Daniel chapter 11 and not Turkey. And then he, he correctly interprets Daniel 11 verse 40b as a response to what happened in 1798. Now, he doesn't necessarily understand the rest of it all correctly. Now, we, looking back, can see that he was correct regarding Daniel 11, verse 40b, and that it marks a repeat of Millerite history as the time of the end, something that he couldn't have seen. So, so you can see how Thiel is actually arguing against himself, and he, he doesn't quite recognize it. Nichols' 1853 article would be published without rebuttal by White, even though James White was then editor, because it was mostly consistent with Miller's and Rich's views as taught by those prominent stalwarts in the Millerite movement, and despite White's views published in 1847. Such evidence dispels the claim that belief in Turkey fulfilling prophecy was... Um, you, James White published views in 1847. What is that? Oh, the word to the little flock. That's what that is. I was wondering what, what would he have published in 1847? Such evidence dispels the claim that belief in Turkey fulfilling prophecy was a removal of any old landmarks pronounced by James White in his 1877 article. And then events in southeastern Europe would create public interest in the eastern question. Six months after Nichols' article, Russia attacked the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans after the great, after Great Britain failed to successfully negotiate on unresolved issues. 
uh, between Russia and France concerning the safe passage of Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land than under the control of Turkey. Suddenly there would be another attempt to shift the balance of power within Europe and the world's attention focused again on the fulfillment of prophecy before their widening eyes. Although the Eastern question has its origins in the conclusion of the Russo-Turkish War, 1768 to 1774, which brought Kabardia and Crimea into Russia's possession, William Miller could not possibly know of its importance to Bible prophecy as it related to the Ottoman Empire and the kingdom, King of the North because he had wrongly concluded that the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14 was the cleansing of this earth at the second coming of Jesus. He thought he was properly adhering to the rules of Bible prophecy interpretation when he applied the history of Napoleon's Russian campaign to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 40, 44 to 45. Napoleon certainly did not appear to have the help of any other nations when he came to his end. But it turns out that Miller didn't know which historical events would more perfectly supply the want of prophecy, even though Josiah Litch had accurately predicted the demise of the Ottoman Empire according to the time prophecies involving the first and second woes ending on August 11th, 1840, which concluded with French and British intervention that curtailed the near Egyptian overthrow of Constantinople. The Crimea War would be the further developed history necessary to partially fulfill that want. So we can see that Thiel is arguing against himself, right? So he's arguing that Miller couldn't have seen things or other people couldn't have seen things because of the time that they were in. But he's not going to want to put Smith in that position, right? Honestly, I lost you. Okay. So what he's saying is he's saying that we had, it's our prox proximity to fulfilled prophecy. So that people who have lived later, they've seen more fulfilled prophecy. So they can be, in a sense, more accurate. So yeah. Miller obviously didn't. And, and, and Adam Clark and these earlier people who are looking at Daniel 11, obviously they couldn't have understood its fulfillment. But that would also go for Uriah Smith. Right. Okay. If he wants to preserve Uriah Smith's understanding and say, well, Weir is wrong because he rejects Uriah Smith's understanding. But the part of the problem is that all of them are con inconsistent with the other prophecies of Daniel 2, 7, you know, an eight, right? If you're going to have Turkey as being the final power, it's inconsistent. So James White is consistent. Now, he makes this comment about um, uh, removing the old landmarks in James White's article. I didn't see anything about the landmarks. Oh, here it is. Lest we be found. Okay. Yes, here it is. Positions taken upon the Eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet their not yet their fulfillment. Here we should tread lightly and take positions care carefully, lest we be found removing the landmarks fully established in the Advent movement. Right. So what he's trying to argue is that Smith wouldn't be removing the landmarks, but I think that there is uh, more here. Uh, than what he's trying, that he's, he's trying to put some words into a James White's mouth. And what James White is really saying is we have uh, these kingdoms of Bible prophecy. If we bring Turkey into it, that doesn't line up with how we understand these lines of Bible prophecy in Daniel. Doesn't fit on the line. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we're going to stop there. And, uh, so hopefully this is helpful going through this. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Not right now. Okay. Well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have had here this morning. We pray for your blessing upon each person who is studying for truth and seeking to perfect a Christian character. We pray for David H. Steele and that you can help him in his walk with you and help us, Lord, to reflect your character in all that we do. Help us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God and uh, to learn the lessons you would have us learn. Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen.